Good morning. If you'd open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. A little earlier I preached on the love of God, and I've enjoyed the preaching so much. I haven't been able to be here for three or four years, and it's worth the wait in the airport. I, I didn't mind at all. But I want to preach to you this morning about the necessity of loving God to recognize idolatry. I want, that was one of the points, and I want to go back to it and expound on it, and I'm hoping it'll help somebody because we live in an idolatrous world, and it's so clear. If, you, if somebody studied anthropology, from the world point of view, they would look back on cultures like Greeks and Romans, and they would say, all the idol worship was back then. But if you read your Bible, it's so obvious that God says the opposite, that as time progresses, idol worship is going to get worse to the point that they're going to bow down and worship the image of the beast. Now, that's hard to conceive, we ha but I can see it clearly when I go to Japan. They are highly industrious, they're highly educated, they're scientific, they are, they are modern, and they are more superstitious than any other people I've ever met. And I'm thinking, is it possible? It seems like a contradiction. And so I'd like to speak to you about it, and I'm going to apply it to church, because how we become idolatrous, and, the, and what makes something an idol? Now, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, he says that the idol's nothing. Right. Idol's nothing. Right. It can be anything. Anything. Man. It can be your guitar. It can be your preaching. It can be your, your Harley Davidson. Yeah. Okay? It can be anything. Because the idols begin in the mind. Right. Casting down every imagination, every high thing that is all through self against the knowledge of God. And so let's look at this again. The loving God is the prerequisite to being able to identify idolatry and its effects. For years I wondered, why does he say this in 1 Corinthians 8? Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. And then all of a sudden, as concerning therefore, in other words, what's just said, eating of those things which are offered unto sacrifice, in sacrifice unto idols, we know that the idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. And then away he goes for three chapters. But those three verses are the key to understanding the rest of it. Without loving God first, we will not be able to recognize the idols in our own life and our own Christianity. And that's why in Revelation chapter 2, it says in the church of Ephesus, Thou hast left thy what? Yeah, it, do, it doesn't say you've lost it. There's a big difference it says, you've left it. So how do you leave it without knowing it? What makes something an idol in a person's heart? What is it in humanity that makes something an idol? Because the idol's nothing. But, but, God, but God is adamant. The prophets, Paul, everybody, the Bible is filled with condemnation of idol worship. What's the big deal? Because most Christians just say, well, I don't worship idols. Yeah. Let's pray. Now, Father in heaven, I pray, God, you'd bless thy word. I pray you'd help us today. God, I need you. I need words to make sense of this. Please give me thy words. And God, I pray that you'd touch the hearts and the minds of the people, Father. Lord, that we would be able to, to catch it before it becomes a, an addiction. And Father, I'd ask you in Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Amen. Now, we know that God saved us, 
and that we are washed in the blood. But one of the things that's so important is we need to understand there is a devil. If you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, please. Hebrews 2, 14. I'd like to just read the scriptures as we go. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, he him also himself likewise took of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not destroyed the power of the devil at Calvary, even washing our sins and souls in the blood and saving us from our sins would have been a little bit futile because we constantly would have had to battle with the devil and lose. But the devil's power is broken at Calvary. The, the worst thing you can do is fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear starts out as a spirit, and then it becomes an emotion afterwards. Now, and that's, that's so important. He says, now is a judgment come the prince of this world. That's John 12, 28. John 14, 30 says, the prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. In other words, when Jesus Christ was sinless, the devil had nothing in him. But now we're... We, we struggle because we, we are just, we're growing Christians. But, so it's a little bit different. So I want to take one passage of Scripture, and I want to ask you first this question. People that make idols or worship idols, do they really believe that they're making gods? Let's go to Isaiah 44. And we'll just, there's other, many other Scriptures that deal with this, we'll just take this one example to make the point. Isaiah 44. Isaiah chapter 44, please, if you would. This, there's other chapters that are, that are just as good, but this one is, is, is helpful. Notice the Bible says here, Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. <clears throat> In other words, the ability to recognize idols was limited to Israel. The other, the other nations worshipped the heavens and the stars because they didn't know that they were made by somebody. Now verse 2, it says, Thus saith the Lord that made thee, which formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. In other words, it's traceable. I will help thee. I will pour water upon him who is thirsty. So on and so forth. Look at verse 3 and 4. I will pour water upon who? Him that's thirsty. It's got to become personal. Loving God. I, you've got, we've got to accept it. Verse 4. They shall spring up as among the grasses, willows, and by the water courses. All right. It must be loving God, knowing God, there's an absolute reality. God is rea reality. God is real. He's the living God. But when people draw away from that, then they make alternative realities. And it comes out in the rest of this chapter. Now let's, let's come down here to verse 9, if you would, please. They that make a graven image are all of them, what? Vanity. And their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be what? Ashamed. All right, remember that. Ashamed. What they're afraid of is being ashamed. Is that what keeps us from coming to this altar and being repent and repent? So the makers of images have no universal object of God. So it's consistent. It says all of them, all of them, all of them. They have empty lives. They're non-profitable. They're conscious of the limitations of their own creations. But, the, but their blindness is intentional blindness because they've refused to be what? 
ashamed. Now, Isaiah starts laying it out a little bit more. Look at verse 10. Who hath formed a what? Or molten graven image that is profitable for nothing. In other, now, who, do, who does that? Who promotes it? A priesthood. Image makers are the who who have discovered that they can make a prophet, a great prophet, by marketing a molten image as a means or a symbol or a, a, an aid to worship. So when you pray, do you try to picture Jesus Christ in your mind? That's cultish. That's, that's a thing called visualization. You're not supposed to picture Jesus Christ. That's, that's why the Bible is very vague about what he looks like. I remember being in Ukraine or selling all, selling all these pictures of Jesus Christ, and they all look different. And there's a nun behind the, the counter, and I said, I'd like a picture of Jesus. And she looked at me like I didn't know him, so I said, well, look at these. I said, which one's him? And she said, pardon? I said, well, which one's him? They all look different. Short hair, long hair, black, white. Which one's him? She got mad because they're all him to her because she refuses to be what? Ashamed. All right. So, but the priest can do it. So even by the, and when Paul goes to Athens and he meets those, those statue makers of Diana, they say, by this craft we have our what? Wealth. So, so they, turn, they turn the worship of God into a religion to make wealth. Now, but then he, now Isaiah talks about not the promotion by the priest, marketing. It makes wealth. Let me give, bring it up to modern times. I was teaching the kids in Sunday school. I was sitting on the platform. The kids are sitting around. I had two toy metal trucks. One, it, there's some value for antiques, but one's an antique old metal truck. Nice, good, modern, but nice. And so I said, how do you like it? So I gave it to the kids. They're playing it. They're pushing it around, and it's a truck. So I said, wonderful. Then out of my bag, I picked up, I picked up a truck that's almost identical, but it's still in the box. Plastic box, you can see through it. You understand what I'm talking about. And then I put that one down. I said, okay, now play with this one in the box. Well, the little boys, they're, they sort of poke at it and... You know, you can't, you can't do that with the toy that's in the box. But to the world and antiques and marketing, which one is worth more? The toy out of the box or the toy in the box? In the box. Same with books. When you are dealing in books, that dust jacket... If it's in good condition, it's about one-third the price of the book, depending on the book. In other words, the pack to the world, the packaging is more important. Now, what is it to you? You see, if the packaging becomes more important, then the product loses the ability to be used as it was designed to be used. In other, did you hear what I said? In other words, they couldn't play and enjoy that toy truck anymore because if it was in the box, it loses the ability to be used as the designer had made it to be used. And if you're more concerned about the packaging and about what you look like, God loses the ability to use you for the design for which you were used. Right. Do you understand that? So what's more, how, how long do you stand in front of the mirror? It's one thing to check out, you stand in the mirror to look at your appearance, but it's another thing if you carry that mirror around all day. Now, we're talking about images because the images are in your imagination. Genesis 5 and 6, it says that their imaginations were evil. 
Isaiah talks about them pictured on the wall. And now we've got the TV sets mounted on the wall. The eye has overcome the ear, but faith cometh by hearing, not by seeing. We worship an invisible God. And as long as you keep picturing him in his mind, you'll create an atmosphere with which to, to live your Christianity through. Instead of letting God give you the circumstances and accept them like they should be and keep on walking like was, like was already preached. Now, now he talks about the production. In verse, in verse 11 he says, And behold, all his fellows shall be what? And the what? Workmen. They are men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. Verse 12 is a smith. Verse 13 is the carpenter. And so he talks about first the promotion by the priesthoods. See, we call it marketing. They can sell products today by the marketing, and people will buy the product without even seeing it. Now, are you marketing Christ? I fear it. See, this is what the modern churches are doing. See, leaving your first love is the beginning of modernism. That's the beginning right there. And so they're marketing Christ as a product. But if you market Christ as a possession, then he no longer lives. He's like that little toy, and you keep him in the box. The workmen now are production. The workmen are not visible to the foolish masses. The products of, sec of secular industry usually have a label on it to say where it's made. But when they're making idols, they don't put labels on it to say where it's made. Why? Talk to me. Yeah. Can you imagine having... Yeah. <laughs> you don't know? Okay. It's law that you have to have it made in China, okay? You have to, or made in Taiwan, or made in America. You have to have a market. That's why logos, if you mess around with a business's logo, they will sue you because they're selling the image, okay? But when you make idols, you don't put a mark on it where it's made because it's supposed to be from heaven. You see, if you put a, if you put a label on it that said made in China, that's, that lessens the spirituality. Now, what label are you marketing? You see, you might be marketing independent King James Bible believer, and it's just a label on your underwear. It's no different. It's no, you're using it to get invited instead of believing it. You see, icons and images are aids to worship. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> oh, you see, they're tradesmen, their skills, their dedication, and they found a means of making a living. Idols are good for business unless you're God and God's people. The Smith, now let's come down to verse 19. And here we get to the crux of the matter. And none considereth in his where? Heart. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea. Also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh. I have eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. Now look at what's it say. A deceived heart hath what? Turned him aside. That he cannot deliver his own soul or say. Here's the, here's the $50,000 question. What does he need to say? Read it. Is there not a lie in my right hand? 
Can you tell when you're lying to yourself? Let's go to one other scripture to pick up this. You see, when did lying, lying cease to be, be a sin and become a skill? Because we... Go to Isaiah chapter 28, please. Isaiah chapter 28. And Isaiah addresses this. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah says, look down there at verse 15, 16. Because they said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we in agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made what? Lies are what? It's safer presenting an image than it is being real. Because then you wouldn't have to repent or ask God and say, oh, God, search my heart. You see, as long as you search your own heart, you won't find anything wrong. Why? Because you've left your first love, and the only way, you, the only way to see things on this earth are right are to see it from heaven. And so he says, we have made lies our refuge. Now read the rest of it. And under falsehood, we have what? Hit ourselves. You hiding in Christian school? Do you come to, you see, church is the safest place to hide from God. A Hindu priest one time said, he said, I'm going to put an image of Jesus Christ in every temple. Then there's no need to become a Christian. And he's telling the truth from his point of view, if you understand what he's saying. So if you come with your idols, you have to decide, is this a lie? Now, can you imagine a smith put up, go back to what Isaiah is saying? They're making an idol, and they're, they're cooking on part of it. They're using what's left over and selling it in the flea markets. And is he act? You see, see, the question is, does he actually believe he's making a God? And God says that there's a sense in which he does. There's a sense in which he doesn't. Because once he starts to move away from God, God blinds him. And he believes the imaginations in his own heart to be real. So he creates an environment in which to worship that false God. Now, do you create an environment in your home? And call it Christianity, but you get into a different environment, and you'd change. And then you'd, then you'd become whatever it needs to be to be worshipped somewhere else. You, you go to another church to raise money on the mission field, and you become whatever they think they believe so that you can make a profit, when in reality, you, you're not believing anything. You're, you're an idol. Yes. You see, you need an... Uh, the medium is the message. A medium is an atmosphere, this is about media, that, be, that is created to live. In other words, if you have goldfish, the medium is the water. Understand that? The medium that God created for us in Genesis is time. We live in time. If, we, if God didn't give us time, we'd go bonkers. But what is it? What is it? Define it. Show it to me. But it's a medium that creates an environment by which we can live. Now, movies, books do the same thing. I know a Christian, a pastor's wife who was addicted to Harlequin romance. One day he was looking for something. He opened her bottom drawer in the bedroom, found the entire thing loaded with Harlequin romance books. He said, what do you, what do you, what's this? He made her throw them out. So what she did was she started hiding them other places. He eventually caught her. And then, she, I wouldn't know this except they told me. And then one day she, she couldn't take him home anymore. She would go out shopping, but she'd buy a Harlequin romance books. She'd go to a Starbucks or sit in her, sit in her 
vehicle and she'd read the thing before she got home and then throw it away. See, pornography is the same thing. Pornography creates an environment. See, pornography is idol worship. If you can understand that. You, you, you're, you're just not... See, that's why God calls it... Once you leave your first love, God calls it fornication. See, pornography is idol worship. Because you, in your mind, you're looking at something on a screen or something in paper, and in your mind, that thing is living. It's, it's an idol, and that's why it becomes addictive. So you look in your Bible. Let's go to another modern example. You look in your Bible, and you see uh, Acts chapter 8. You see uh, Simon the sorcerer, and different people were called sorcerers. But you, this thing increases once you get to the book of Revelation. It's still going on. And you think, well, I, I've never, I, I don't know any sorcerers. Look it up in your concordance. You know what the word is? Pharmaca, pharmacy. You ever go to the pharmacy? Sorcery. So I don't believe that. I'm just on these drugs. Hey! You see, in those days, the sorcerers were the scientists and the chemists. That's why, and it's increased. Yeah. It's sorcery, pharmaca, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals. You say, well, we don't have any idolatry. Pop. Hey! Look it up. In the, it's in the concordance. So how does it take place in our lives? What is the first step when something slips from being the love of God to being an idol? I don't know if you're going to believe this or not, but I'll show it to you. It's when you're insincere. When you're insincere. We're going to look at a few verses, but let me give you the definition first because it's important. Insincere means without wax. In other words, in porcelain and pottery, when they had deformities or cracks in that glassware, that stoneware that they used to make, they didn't want to people to see the flaws, so they'd fill it with wax, and they'd use mixtures of honey and different things like that to cover up the imperfections. Now, can you apply that to yourself, or do I have to tell you? Insincere. It means being in reality. It means a pure and unmixed. So being insincere is when it's mixed. Being, being sincere means not feigned. You're not pretending. You're being absolutely honest. It means not simulated. Man, we live in a, in a day and age where everything's simulated. Not hypocritical. Not pretending. Not disguised. When people greet you, you tell them the truth. Amen. Honesty of mind and intentions. So that's what sincerity means and insincere. Let's look at a few verses. Go to Philippians chapter 1, please. Philippians chapter 1. That's, that's how you leave your first love and yet still think, well, I love God. When we begin to be insincere, you see, that's what they've got to be. To be able to say, to make an idol and then bow down and worship it, they've got to believe a lie and accept it because they want it so badly to be real. Right. 
Philippians chapter 1, please. Look down there at verse 9 and 10. Look at those words. Philippians 1. I read part of it about love, but I didn't keep reading. But look at verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all what? Knowledge and judgment, like banks of a river, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be what? Sincere and without what? Offense to the day of Christ. In other words, the thing that's going to help me to not sin against God is being absolutely sincere, real, no wax. You know what the definition also means? It, 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 it means to be tested by sunlight and hold it up to the light. I think, who? Are you willing to let God hold you up to the light? God assess it. You see, let's look at another verse. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the what? Sincere. Sincere milk of the word that you may what? Maybe your growth is stunted. It's not the word that's changed. It's your attitude towards it because you can't drink sincere milk unless you take it sincerely. You see, truth, if it's unbelieved, is still fiction. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm not calling the Bible fiction, but I'm saying if you don't believe it, you're making it fiction in your mind. Let's, let's, go, let's go to Joshua chapter 24. A great passage. Joshua trying to help the children of Israel. Joshua chapter 24. Are you willing to quit pretending you're something you're not and quit pretending you're something you are? In other words, hiding what you don't want people to see or what you don't want God to see and presenting an image because as long as they believe the package, I'm safe inside. Joshua chapter 24. Look down there, please, at verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in what? Sincerity and in truth. And put away what? The gods. You see, it's connected. They can't put away the gods until they serve God in sincerity and truth. Because the truth is sincere. It's without wax. It's perfect. There's no, there's no pretending. There's no goofing around with it. There's no hypocrisy. There's no disguise. Is your Christian dress a disguise? Because in your mind, you're living in a different world. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you'd look down there at verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, and notice the progression again. I better read verse 6. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, what? Leaven of the whole bunch. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Not a period, colon. Then it says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. You know one of the things that's become idolatrous? The Lord's Supper. People take that bread, people take the Lord's Supper, and you're sitting doing that, and you've got ought against each other in the body of Christ, and you don't even believe the words when, God's, when God says, judge yourselves. 
You don't believe it when it says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. you. Say, no, no, that wouldn't make me sick. It's just a piece of bread. Hey, would you go to a Roman Catholic mass and take some of that? Why not? I'd say. It's not true. Then why would you make the Lord's Supper untrue? The Bible says you cannot eat at the devil's table and the Lord's table. Now, where is the Lord's table? Talk to me. Where is it? It's your heart. You have it at church here. Now, where do, you think the, where do you think the devil's table is? Have you ever considered it might be the same table? And what makes it the difference between being the devil's table and the Lord's table is you. Because if you take it insincerely, hiding, covering the cracks, not being judged by the sunlight, then you're turning that thing into nothing more than an idol and eating a cookie and thinking it's a, the body of Christ. But to you, it's just an idol because it doesn't bother you to take it insincerely. It doesn't bother you one bit. Nobody knows. Huh. And then somebody stands up and gives a testimony and said, I've hated such. And you realize for years people have been sitting there taking the Lord's Supper and hating and devouring each other. And you think, why doesn't that scare you to death? Where's the conviction of the Holy Ghost? You can't call it the Lord's table by just putting a label on it. It's the Lord's table by the Lord. But you can turn it into the devil's table by your own imaginations and heart. And you make it you make it into something that it wasn't meant to be. Why? The condition of the heart changes the nature of the act. The plowing of the wicked is sin. All right then. So then doing God's work without prayer is sin. Activity, carnality can produce a great deal of activity, but it cannot produce spirituality. And so when we do something for the show, for the packaging, it, it kills us because we, we, we handicap God. He can't move. That's why God says, I wish you were hot. I wish you were cold instead of being lukewarm. What is lukewarm? Being comfortable because I can stay safe in my package and I can, I can have my Christian religion as long as I can keep, out of the, keep God out of the box. The Lord's table. Go over to the first Corinthians chapter five. Let's just think about that for a minute. See, everything God gave Israel that was external, they got it messed up. And the external became part, more important than the real. First Corinthians chapter five, look at verse seven and eight. Or did I just read that? I just read it. Okay, let's think of circumcision. Israel is an example. God gives Israel, God gives Adam's circumcision, and it's so clear. There's passages in the Bible in the Old Testament where it says about circumcising your what? Heart. But they forgot all about that. But boy, they kept that circumcision. I'll never miss coming to church on Sunday. But are you coming to God? See, they kept that circumcision, and they forgot all about it. And so Paul says in Romans 2, he says, a true Jew is one that's circumcised in his heart. They missed it. And it's the same with that brazen serpent. That look and live. And that thing ended up being what? An idol, and they had to destroy it. You know, there's probably some things in your Christianity need to be destroyed. Because it's keeping you from God. Why? Well, if I face God, I'd have to be willing to change. The only thing that's going to be make you willing to change is a revelation of the love of Jesus Christ. Faith makes obedience possible, but love makes it easy. Amen. 
Let's think about another thing in church that can be an idol, baptism. It's become so much of an idol, people think they get saved by it. But what about the people that don't think it get, saves them, but they don't think it's much? When you're to get baptized under Moses, the man that led you to Christ doesn't baptize you, the pastor does. See, there's something about baptism when you're submitting to authority. It's supposed to be a picture of being dead to the world. Or do you just get baptized and, and clean up, but you don't really die to the world. You just turn it on and off when you're at church or when you're at home or at school. That's being insincere. Baptism. Romans 5. Know you not as many of us as are baptized in Jesus Christ are baptized unto his death, not his life. You've got to consent to your death. Paul's, let's, is that, am I making sense to you? I'll never forget Marvin Clanton say, saying one time, he said, you tell a lie, you believe a lie, you live a lie, you become a lie. I remember talking with a man that was in trouble. I put him out of church. About seven years later, he came back. He was in my home just a little bit ago. And I asked, and it was, it was wonderful. And I asked him, what happened? What changed? He said, he said, Pastor, he said, I lost touch with reality. And that brings me to my next point. Is your repentance real? Repentance can be faked. Go to Romans chapter 7, if you would, for a minute. Romans chapter 7. You all know this is the... This is the great chapter that Paul writes on the flesh. But verse 1, he says, Know ye not, brethren, bracket, for I speak to them that what? Know the law. Know the law. That's the key. If you don't understand the purpose of the law, God didn't give you grace to disobey. God didn't give us grace to break the law. He came to fulfill the law. If, if there's no, where's the, is there a hunger for holiness? Is there a hunger for God? Is there a hunger for righteousness? Are you willing to count all things but loss to, to hunger and thirst after righteousness in Jesus Christ? Or is it just you're going to obey where you feel like it benefits you and you don't obey when you disagree? And so in repentance, it, it can be a it can be a problem because in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, if God giveth what? We better, we better go to it. 2 Timothy 2, I want you to read it. 2 Timothy 2, please. Are you being sincere? Are you going to leave this meeting and say how great it was and go on living the same? Look, but look at the words. I'm trying to connect this to demonism for you and idolatry. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Is this not a lie in my right hand? If God, peradventure, give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, keep reading, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of who? The devil, the devil, the devil. You think, well, I just, I just don't want to do it. I, I, think, I think the preacher is wrong. That's demonic. You say, no, it's not. Well, then let me give you an illustration. Jesus tells Peter, the disciples, about being crucified. First time he did it, after they acknowledged him as Lord. And then Peter since good heart, sincere, but sincerely wrong, shows compassion. Says, oh, Lord, not so, Lord. Now, you would have thought, you know what most Christians say? Well, thanks for the sympathy. You know, uh, I appreciate you praying for me, and uh, I'm glad you understand. And Peter probably thought he's going to get a hug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just logically speaking, you know, somebody tells you a, a sob story, and you think, oh, man, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. And instead, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter must have gone. 
Me? No, no, Lord, Lord, you misunderstood. I care for you. And you don't see it. Let me... A river, when it gets polluted, I enjoyed that message last night in the water. But a river, when it gets polluted, it doesn't disappear. It keeps, it keeps flowing where it's going. You can still swim in it. You can still boat in it. And it still looks like a river for a long time. But because it's getting polluted, the life is dying in it. And it's the same with our Christianity. We still look like a river. We still talk like a river. We're still coming to church like a river. But the life is dying because we're not sincere in repenting. Because we've got idols in our heart. And we won't cast down our imaginations. We're... We want, we're putting the own, our own wax in, hoping that God will accept it. You got to be careful of repentance. I, when, when people come to repent, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many times they go to Calvary in their imagination. What are you going there for? If you're, if you're lost, you come to Calvary. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. But if you're saved, if we all took a plane and went to Jerusalem, he's not there. Brother Chuck preached on where he is. He's our advocate. You should be going to the advocate in heaven. But in people's minds, they're going to Calvary because they feel so bad that they've let God down. And they'll cry and cry. I, I've got people at church, they'll cry and cry. I'll dismiss the service. You say, don't you care? I've had to take them in the back and say, hey, I've had them come up to me and say, oh, Chuck, can, Pastor, can I, go, I, I, need, I, I need to get before the congregation and confess this sin. I say, come, and, come with me. And, I, and I'll sit down on top and say, no. Why? Because what they're doing, they're not doing repentance. They're doing penance. In other words, you feel so bad that you've let God down, you're going to kick yourself and you've got to humiliate yourself and other people because you really don't believe that if you confess your sins, Jesus Christ will cleanse you. You don't believe you're forgiven, so you've got to go that little bit extra more to be, to be down, to be, to be defeated, and, and, and to get that sympathy because you think that somehow confessing it and getting it right with God isn't enough so you've got to do more to make yourself and everybody else miserable but it feels safe because now I've really repented hey hey that's not Bible repent you're not cleaning yourself but you're trying. Yeah. That's good. Repentance. Another thing that becomes an idol is church discipline. There is so much in this Bible about separation. And yet you, you try and get people to separate. And you find out they're sneaking around. Hey, they don't even need to sneak anymore. They just need to text. And they, you've got all kinds of connections with people that are not walking with God, and yet you know the verses, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Yeah. You know that stuff. Evil communications corrupt good matters. But you think, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm in the box. Yeah. I've got my armor on. No, you got cardboard box. Why? Because you're messing with demonic things, and you think you can handle it. So you'll go to the baby showers, you'll go to all this stuff, because you feel sympathy. And so church discipline isn't working. Now, Brother Cody's message on mercy was fantastic, but he was so clear in giving us the Bible definition. 
Mercy is only shown to who? The guilty. You know what the problem with Christians is? You want mercy without admitting you're guilty. You, you, you don't want to admit you're guilty. You want to make everybody else feel bad for separating from you. And it's why? Because you're an idol in your heart. How, you say, how, let me sh expound on this a bit more. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, please. Deuteronomy chapter 1, we're talking about church discipline. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now, this, this boy, whew, Deuteronomy chapter 1, you know this is, Deuteronomy means repeat. They're getting ready to go into the promised land, and there's lots happening here. But come down to verse 37. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou shalt not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in hither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now look at verse 39. So, in other words, the people that didn't go in, when you get down to the basic base motive, what's holding them back? Look at verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said, what? Should be a prey. And your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in hither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Okay, the first part of the verse is the point. Here's these people coming out of Egypt. God brought them out. They've seen the miracles. In type, they're dead to the world. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're baptized, so to speak. But they get caught in that wilderness because what are they concerned about? What's it say? Their children. Guess what their idols are? Their children. In other words, when somebody needs to separate, put under church discipline, you think, well, what about the kids? Because you, th you would rather have them back in Egypt than to follow God and have to listen to this preaching. You think it's harder on your children to be spiritual, and you'd rather them be just as carnal as you are because then God can't move you. Well, you know, we're going to church. We're doing everything we need to. But when are you going to get sold out to God and let go of the control and let Christ lead? When are you going to let him take over? When you fall into diverse circumstances, what's your first response? Worry or worship? Are you dangerous to the devil? Or are you quietly working with them? Church discipline. Church discipline. They, in other, in other words, and, and you know who they're thinking like? Pharaoh. When they asked to go out and worship, Pharaoh said, keep your children here. That's a mean desert out there. You don't want your children walking in the desert, not knowing where they're going, following that crazy man, Moses. Wouldn't you rather be here where everywhere you're safe and comfortable and you don't have to get excited or moved? F Pharaoh said that, and the people ended up believing it. So they come Sunday morning. But they don't come to prayer meeting. Don't come Wednesday night. Why? It's an idol. The devil will do everything he can to keep you out of deep sin. Because if he lets you get into deep sin, you might repent and get saved. So the devil will do everything he can to keep you comfortable and happy and content, especially in your churchianity. But, but to let it all go. Why? We, 
Our brother talked about the hot sand. Where are we going? I don't know, but we're just following God. Church discipline. Church discipline. Another thing that gets to be an idol is church membership. I'm a member of Shady Acres Baptist Church or Canadian Baptist Bible Church. Well, what does that mean? Well, it could mean you're garnishing the sepulchers. And you talk about the old preachers because you want to be identified with them and make everybody else think you believe what they believe and you're walking what they're walking. But in reality, wouldn't it be ins insincere to admire them and then not follow them? Doesn't that sort of, is that a lie? My right hand. Well, it can't be a lie because I made it. I believe it. So it must be true. Go to Romans chapter 13. We're talking about church membership. When you become a church member, you're supposed to tithe. Romans chapter 13, please. Romans chapter 13. Let's look at this, just one verse. Look down there at verse 8. I want to c connect this to the previous message. Owe no man anything but to what? Love one another. And notice, it's not a period. See the grammar? It's not a period. It's a colon. And then he says... For he that loveth another hath what? Fulfilled the law. All right. Now, owe no man anything but to what? Love one another. So there's a connection between paying your bills and loving. You pay your bills because you love your family. Right? So not tithing at church is not a financial problem. It's a love problem. You see, if you're if you're if you're to, if you're to owe man no man anything, yet love one another, well, what do you think oh, you owe God? And you say, well, I can't tithe. It's not a financial problem; it's a love problem. I don't know if I can explain that. Yes, sir. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why? Because what you love, you worship. See, when we have, when they have offerings, I like watching these little kids. It's like the top's not connected to the bottom. It's just so funny. And they're bringing money up. But, but, do, you, but do you sit there and get no joy out of giving? It's a love problem. They left their first love. The prerequisite to recognizing idolatry is loving God. If any man love God, the same shall be known in him. And then three chapters. And when I stop loving God, being insincere, hypocritical, not being honest with myself, those imaginations and that mind, you can justify yourself so easy and find a Bible verse to stand on it. But you've got to leave out the context and everything else. Church membership. Garnishing the sepulchers of the old saints. Well, the Pharisees said, well, we didn't kill the old people. We weren't even there. You kill your pastor? See, but the person killing you thinks you deserve it. Why? 
because they can't see the idol in your own heart, but they'll break other idols because they wish it was them. They'll break your idols because they want to worship their idol, their own idols. But to worship God, there's no glory. There's no prestige. God does it all, as we've already heard. But that's humiliating. The Bible says the devil was the father of lies. When did lies only become lives when you got caught? We live in a society that it's not a lie. They'll get all what they want as a lawyer, not truth. Now, when you go to the advocate, like Brother Leonard preached, don't ask him to defend your lie. So you'd rather defend yourself. The last thing is prayer. Do you have a prayer life? If you don't have a prayer life, do you have life? If, if Jesus prayed, shouldn't we? Is, is re prayer just repeating words? How many times do you say the Lord's name when you pray? He knows who he is. Oh, Lord, please help me. Lord, I, need, I can't find Lord to do this. Lord, he knows who he is. Right. If, I was talking, if I was talking to Brother Bobby here and said, Brother Bobby, how are you doing today? Brother Bobby, I really like your tie. Brother Bobby, where'd you get those boots? Brother Bobby, what you reading? Eventually, Brother Bobby's going to say, what does, he keep, what does he keep doing? Yeah. Do, do you think God's forgotten who he is? So what we're afraid of is silence. And we fill up space with repeated words that come to mean nothing. I, I, get, I get caught. I, you know, there's times I've cried out, I have, I have lists and, 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 and things. And there's times I've said, God, I'm sitting here and I'm reading these people. I'm embarrassed telling you this. But I'm reading these people's names, these preachers, and I said, I'm reading these names, and, and thoughts are going through my head. And I said, but God, there's nothing coming out my mouth. And I'm thinking, oh, God, help. And it, making a list, checking it twice. <laughs> Is it just simply going through a list like shopping? Or do you take the time and say, God, what do you want me to pray? What is thy will? How, how? Lord, I don't have the facts. You do. Do you have a prayer life? Oh. The silence. When we have a conversation, if, if I said, uh, hello, Brother Cox, how you doing? Hey, where'd you get those glasses? And he's about to say, well, I'm doing... If, if, if I asked him how he's doing and then didn't stop to listen for a reply, wouldn't you think that's kind of odd? You know, if you tell somebody, they, somebody asks you, how are you doing? They, and you say, oh, my, my wife just died. And they keep on saying, man, sure is good to be here in this meeting. And they say, my wife just died? Hey, hey, it's good to see you. How, how's the ministry? My wife just died. Do we ever, we have all these prayer requests, do we take the time to be quiet, be still, and know that I'm God, and listen for God to say something? Oh. 
Or is it just running through the list as fast as you can? Prayer has become such an idol, there's incense burners in some religions. I've been at funerals where, where I don't know who the minister, quote unquote, is. I can't close my eyes and pray. I have no idea who he's praying to. I was at a, one of my relatives' funerals, and the man in the robes and all that, he prayed, and I stood up. And then they wanted me to say something about my aunt. And I, said, and I said, I have no idea what God he's praying to. I said, but his God's not my God. And then I preached. See, you didn't say that. Yeah, I did. I have, and all I'm saying, is he an idol? And you're chanting? Or praying. Idols in church, the Lord's table, church discipline, church membership, repentance, prayer, baptism. Are you sincere? Let's stand. Is your love increased for Jesus Christ or it's fading? We have made lies our refuge. Maybe camp meetings your idol. Could you say guilty? Mercy. Page 308. 